I spend so much time up in my head and with all these stories and narratives, which may or may not be true. And so for me at walking, I learned after a number of years as a way to get really connected to what I was, yeah. what I knew, my, that internal understanding. Welcome everyone. I am so excited to be here today with Libby Delena. Libby, welcome to What the Fundraising. Oh, thank you. I'm really excited for this conversation. I am so excited to be here with you. And I feel like your work and what you do and who you are spans so many different things and influence folks in so many different ways. But do you want to give just a little introduction to you for everyone? Sure. So my name is Libby. I live north of Boston in a beautiful little seaside community called Newburyport. Um, I spent had, or spent most of my career in the advertising world as a creative director and an art director by trade, which is really the person when creating messaging materials worries about what everything looks like. That was my craft and world. I still do that to a degree. But what I'm really focused on now is um, something that I started in 2011, which is a morning walk practice. So one morning I woke up and uh, realized that while life was really grand, I had absolutely nothing to complain about, healthy family, good friends, lovely work, that um, there was something in my days that I, that I wasn't nourishing or um, hosting. And that was, um, for me, being in the outdoors is where I'm really happy. So I decided on one day that every morning I'd get up half an hour early and go for a walk. And I've committed to that for 30 days. And here I am 10 and a half years later and I've never missed a day. So um, the work I'm really doing now is um, just sharing with people the possible transformative power of a simple walk. Mm. I love that. And I love the book and we'll make sure to link that below. And I remember there was something about when you, I, I went and heard you speak almost a year ago now up at yes. Camp Avida. If anyone's uh, looking for a wine subscription, check out Camp Avida. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful wines. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, to benefit Blink Now and Maggie Doyne, folks love um, the episode with her here. And you and Cheryl Strayed were talking about the book and you were talking about the journey and, and even just sort of the idea of one foot in front of the other. And it was so interesting because as you were talking, I was probably the only one in the audience thinking what she's saying is exactly what my fundraising process was like, like her kind of one foot in front of the other, the transformation sort of gauntlet that you went through was so, so resonated with my fundraising journey. So will you just talk to folks a little bit about that? Yeah, what a great question. And I would say that the concept of what just one foot in the in front of the other certainly holds tr powerfully true for walking but i think the thing that's so powerful about it is once you really embed that into your body and you really understand the concept it applies to everything in life right mm -hmm. the way i like to talk about it is you know just take the next best step whatever that looks like take the next mm -hmm. best step and sometimes we have headwinds sometimes it's raining sometimes it feels like oh my gosh i've walked four miles out, I turn around, the headwind is stiff. The only thing we can possibly do at that moment is get really present mm -hmm. and think about that one step. Don't think about getting all the way back to the car, four miles up the road, just that next step. And I, I like the idea of the next best step because that means that each step is uniquely different. You, you flex depending on what's happening. Is there a puddle? Is in your fundraising journey, is there a hurt? Is the next step uphill because all of a sudden there's this um, situation you need to solve? Um, so each step is unique. Each breath is different. Every moment brings a unique scenario. And so if we can learn the lesson of just take the next best step I think it is really applicable to everything we do. And, you know, the, the thing about a walking practice is um, doing it every day, every single step, every single day is unique. And uh, just breaking it down to steps versus walks mm -hmm. is the way I think um, 
I think there are embedded really profound lessons in each of those steps. Yeah, that makes me wonder what's the shortest walk you've ever done to, to keep that goal? Oh, what a great question. I think probably, you know, about five years ago, for some reason, when I get ill, I get the same thing over and over. I get strep throat and then I get a sinus infection, then I get uh, pneumonia. So I had pneumonia and um, I was really not feeling well at all, but um, I actually knew that what would make me feel better and maybe it's more sort of psychologically and, and in terms of mental health, what would make me feel better was to go for a walk. And I literally had my jammies on, I put a long coat mm -hmm. on, it was probably March, and I walked around the block, which probably took me five minutes, mm -hmm. six minutes maybe. Um, and as I love to sort of hold, it's not about the number of steps, it's not about the number of miles, really, um, what I want to hold true is the fidelity to the practice. Mm -hmm. What's most important is that commitment to myself to do this. Some people may have a seated meditation practice or a yoga practice. Mm -hmm. I view my walking practice as a similar kind of um, experience. And for me, the most important thing, as I said, is not miles or number of steps. It's, it's uh, fidelity to myself and my well-being. And what makes, oh, I mean, one could say, well, walking from the second floor to the first floor to go to the kitchen um, could be considered a walk. And if that works for you, that's great. For me, it's about intention and stepping out the back door and being outdoors and um, grounding in that place. So for me, that's what counts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like showing up for yourself in a certain way, like something about, even when I think about doing your, this practice, the first thing I think is, well, I won't always have time, right? Like that narrative around, like, how do I create time for that? How do I create space for that? And I think saying, no, I'm, I'm always going to create space for this in my life. Cause this is important to me is a type of like building a relationship with ourselves that is so valuable. I mean, I look at it as the equivalent of brushing my teeth. Yeah. Or eating, eating well each day. They're non-negotiable. And mm -hmm. I know that they are essential for my well-being, um, for my spirit, for my mental health, for my physical health, for my outlook on life. So they're they're sort of not negotiable. I mean, brushing our teeth mm -hmm. isn't negotiable. Drinking water isn't. So to me, it is um it is a non-negotiable. Um, and it is to your, as you said beautifully, it is about showing up for ourselves. And what I always like to say is the way I practice this, my practice is unique to me. It is what I do is not applicable to anybody else, how they might adopt or hold this practice. Um, you know, it, I happen to be 60 years old. I'm an empty nester. I have time in my day. Um, it'd be very different if I had littles at home. It'd be a different scenario. And I totally recognize that. So it really is about, um, as you say, making that space and that time and um, to, to host this practice. Um, and it's powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do, I do small walks all the time when I hear that narrative around, I don't have time. I'm like, okay, well, I can walk for two minutes around the block or just get outside, walk from the car to the gate, touch the gate, go in the house. <laughs> Absolutely. You yes, know, and what if I have to. Yeah. What I often say is, you know, think about if 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 this holds true, if this scenario looks familiar to you, if you go to the market, you could park as far away yeah. as you possibly can from the front door. And as you put your feet on the ground to walk into the market, really it's an invitation mm -hmm. to really for that moment think about how your feet are going on the ground. Think about your breath. Think about, so it could be from literally the corner of the market parking lot to the front door of, of, you know, wherever you're going and just attending to your own well-being at that moment. So it can look like that too. Mm, I love that because walking meditation has actually always been one of the, and I didn't really think about that. I don't know why in terms of this practice, but that is for, for, has always been for me, actually the way I feel the most grounded. And I do with clients a lot, even not walking, but sitting in their chair, putting both their feet on the ground, closing their eyes, 
making sure every part of their foot is touching the ground on both sides. It's just amazing. Like our feet to the earth, what happens in that connection? Yeah, that's right. Uh, For me, it is actually the only way I understand what I feel, which may sound ridiculous. I spend so much time in my head thinking about things Mm -hmm. that I don't do a very good job of connecting with what my body, my instinct, my grounded intuition and knowledge knows. So for me, as I said in our book is, it's only by adding motion to emotion is that's the only way I understand it. So what happens is I'm able to connect to your point with my feet on the ground at the moment, the moments as I walk, and I can at that point begin to really hear what that internal wisdom is. Otherwise, I spend so much time up in my head and with all these stories and narratives, which may or may not be true. And so for me, walking, I learned after a number of years as a way to get really connected to what I was yeah. What I knew, my, that internal understanding. Yeah. And Ethan Cross, who was the first ever episode of What the Fundraising, he wrote this book called Chatter. And he talks about going outside being a huge strategy around, around chatter. So that also makes sense. Like, And he talks about different body connections. So I love that. And I think one of the things that's also really interesting about your story is you're an athlete. And so when you first started walking, like many people think of walking as part of their fitness life, you know? And so there was this unraveling, it sounded like that really needed to happen for you and this sort of separation around previous assumptions of what walking is and is all about and is for and what goals there are. So will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's so well said. You're absolutely right. So when I grew up in high school, I mean, early Title IX, I'm 60, and um, I played field hockey, basketball, lacrosse, and then I went on to college and I was a rower. I spent a lot of time doing that. I loved uh, the world of athletics. I loved um, that whole um, companionship, partnership, teammates. I loved that world. So when I started this practice, it... um, it probably, and I'm not really super proud of this, it probably took me two or three years to get over my ego. My ego kept saying, Lib, you're an athlete. Yeah, you're a national champion rower, blah, 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 blah. You're just walking? You sh- should be running. I'm doing air quotes. You should mm-hmm. be running. You should be on a bike. You should be cardio at, you know, anaerobic threshold, all this stuff. And it took me a long time to unlearn that story and realize that this practice was not about a workout or exercise. Now, don't get me wrong. It's fabulous. It's a fabulous, um, subtle, gentle form of um, moving your body. You can't get injured. I think I'll do it until the day I'm no longer on the planet, which is pretty amazing. Um, But it took me a while because I think I thought it was uh, to be perfectly honest, kind of lame mm. and not really um, something to be proud of. And that just was a humbling sort of unlearning of, um, you know, identified with this label as the athlete, the champion, whatever it might be. And um, it, it took me a while to understand that actually what I was doing was not parallel to that or it, was, it wasn't in that ecosystem of athletics. It was a very different kind of experience. Yeah, it took me a while. <laughs> I actually think that makes total sense. I mean, those things are so built into to who we are. And, and probably even, I'm thinking about this for the first time, probably even like when, mo- when a type of motion or a type of activity is like linked to a belief, starting to separate those things is really hard. And maybe that's also what really kind of like activated me thinking about its relationship to my fundraising journey, because so much of that for me was about like unlearning, unlearning beliefs about money, about generosity, about relationships, about value. And it was this sort of constant, okay, here are all the things I have believed about these things 
but do they apply to this or do I want them to apply or do they have to apply? You know, like there totally is a way to have a daily walking routine that is about fitness and athleticism in different ways. But you were consciously like, that's (laughs) not what this is for me. And I think I had that same moment with fundraising where I couldn't keep going the other way. I was like, I can't do this the way everyone's telling me this is what this is for. This is what this is about. This is how you do this thing. I was like, that feels wrong to me. And so I was like, okay, what does it look like to do this in a way that actually feels good every single day? And then creating that like practice for myself, which is so funny. I was sitting there. I remember, and just being like, no one else is thinking about how this links to their fundraising right now. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say that is so beautifully stated though. Right. Um, I think as we just said, you know, the, the lessons embedded within this practice, and I think it's probably true for a seated, you know, meditation practice too. There's so many lessons embedded within it that are applicable to so many parts of our life. And I think you're right. I mean, I think the narrative around fundraising used to have a certain sort of uh, storyline. Um, do we have to continue to believe in those storylines? Can we look at it differently? Can we begin to reshape it in a way that feels true for me and how I move through the world? And I think that, yeah, I think, I think the lessons are exactly the same, just in different spheres. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the walking, the piece that walking really adds to the like that piece around sort of seated meditation versus walking is that thing about motion because, and and I think about that with fundraising too, in terms of action. I say that to folks all the time, like how do you stay in action? Because seated meditation makes most people wildly uncomfortable. Right. You (laughs) need to add energy to it. You need to add energy to something to begin to activate it and ignite it. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. And some people are better than me at sitting through that discomfort. But I also, even when I was practicing yoga more regularly, did much more kind of vinyasa flow. And it was less about the fitness and more about that level of motion allowed me to go there to sort of like be super present. And so, and I think that's the same with fundraising. It's like when we're sitting there thinking about all the things that we have to do or all the emails we have to send, it's wildly uncomfortable. But the moment you start typing, the moment you start clicking send a few times, you pick up the phone, it's like you're in motion, you're in action. And it's, so I think it's such a good like example of that. Right. Take that, take that next step, write that email, take that next step. You can't get all the way, as I you know, said earlier, you can't get all the way back to the trailhead yeah. uh, immediately. You have to, each step is required in that process, in that step, in that um, journey. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really interested actually in those two to three years where you were telling yourself you should be doing something different, but instead you kept walking. How did you do that? How did you every day overcome the should? Um, that's such a good question. I think um, I think ultimately at the end of the day, it's parallel to what you just said, which is as soon as you start writing that email, as soon as you've picked up that call, that phone once and made a call, and these are gentle, incremental steps, but as you begin to do it more and more, there's more confidence that builds. There's more dopamine that shows up. There's more um, belief because you've now done it a number of times. So for me, um, I committed to doing it for 30 days after 30 days. I, it was very clear for me that I always felt better after having taken a walk. Now it wasn't magnificent. It wasn't, you know, fireworks going off, but I always felt better. And so despite the fact that the little voice in my head might have said, oh, you know what, you've done it for 30 days in a row, take a break, rest, mm. you don't need to do it. Remember just sort of thinking, I literally would turn to that voice that said, you should be running or take a break and simply say, thank you for that input. I know I feel better when I go for a walk. See you later, mm. I'm going. So it was sort of acknowledging, hearing that voice understanding in a way what my psyche was doing Mm -hmm. and then really show honestly showing up for myself and saying but you know what here's the thing when I pick up that phone and call that donor when I take that next step and I haven't broken my streak you feel really proud about yourself you know you know when that voice says oh you don't need to do this and then you believe it and you don't do it 
you don't feel good about yourself after. I don't. No, I don't. I don't. And then the voice comes back and is said and says, you're so lazy. You didn't do that thing. Exactly. It's a, it's a real trickster. It's a real trickster. <laughs> She's very, very, very um, convincing and coming at it from two different directions. So I think what I realized to your point, that's beautifully said is, you know, once you give in, then the voice says, well, look at you, you didn't go, you're not committed. Mm-hmm. Um, and all that trash in our heads gets really confusing. And I just, you know, I, I got to a point, it's, you know, where I knew that that walk was going to be impactful. And I would almost say, and I think it probably holds true with, you know, uh, development issues too, which is, um, I I can say that a majority of the time when that little voice showed up and tried to convince me either not to go or to, you know, whatever, um, go shorter or, um, it was when, it was on those days that when I did go, I always did go, that it was on those days that I knew I had to go, Mm -hmm. that there was actually more to learn on those days because I looked at that little voice and said, I'm not believing you. And so now when I do it over and over again, when it shows up in other arenas and says, oh, you don't need to make that phone call. Oh, you don't need to do whatever it might be. I now have the resilience and the sort of muscle memory to say, you know what, little voice, I hear you, but I've now practiced this for 10 years. I don't believe you anymore. Mm. Ooh, that, I mean, to me, that's really like the whole thing is like developing a relationship, understanding that number one, that voice is not the truth. It's not some like higher truth telling you the right thing. It's not you. That's not like you saying that it's, I don't know what it is, but it's not like our truest selves to, I love what you said, like acknowledge and validate it. And then make your own decisions separate from it. Like that's okay. That's input, but what do I actually want? And why have I been doing this? And because yeah, that voice comes up and then really shifting what I hear you also saying is shifting your expectation then in all the areas of your life around what that voice means. Um, which I think is just, I don't know, maybe the key to life. (laughs) Because I I say a lot too to my clients, like, look, I don't think the self-critic ever fully goes away. I've certainly never met anyone who doesn't have that voice, you know, but I think it's about choosing, like, does it have the microphone? You know, like, that's what I'll say when it comes up for me. I'm just like, who gave you the microphone? Why are you so loud today? Like, I'm just going to take that back. You're trying to protect me from something. I don't know what it is. Thanks so much, but I don't need you. I'm going to be okay. Um, And it's just this constant, constant dialogue. And that's why I call it a practice, a walking practice, because when that voice shows up every single time, it is a practice to say, thank you very much for that perspective but you know what? I know I feel better when I go for a walk. And it is on these, mo- in these moments when you tell me not to go, that I usually learn the biggest lessons. Yeah. And I think that may be applicable to your clients yes. too. It's when that little voice says, oh my gosh, that donor, that's such a, that's, uh, yeah, that's a scary moment. Think how wonderful it feels when you actually believe in yourself to do it, to make that call, to send that email, that feeling is intoxicating. And it's, um, that, but you have to practice it. it. It does get easier, but it is not an overnight light switch. You know what? Yeah. That little voice, forget it. It shows yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So tell us about some of the lessons. Like when you say those were the days I learned the biggest lessons, what are some things that walking has really taught you? In the last few years, a la pandemic, um, I really focused on the quiet, the power of it being quiet. Mm. And what I mean by that is I wouldn't have my earbuds in, I wouldn't be listening to music or podcasts or anything, in part because the news felt so sort of heavy. Mm. So I walked a lot in the quiet. And I would say what came up were specifics about my life that I never would have heard unless it was quiet. They were subtle whispers they were, it was um, a bodily intelligence that um, in the Russian buzz of the day and the excitement and curiosity of the day, I didn't know about myself. And so it was in that quiet, sometimes shadowy, 
but it was in that quiet where it's like, oh, wow, look at that about yourself. Or so I think it was the power of quiet, which can be scary and beautiful. Um, so I think that was one lesson is there, there's a lot to be learned when it's really silent and quiet. And um, another is this notion that, I hope this isn't too heady, but you know how we talk about beautiful sacred places, places where you feel, you feel a sense of belonging, whether it's, you know, under a beautiful tree or in the company of friends or the beach, wherever it might be. Um, I began slowly to learn that actually the sacred places were internal as well. Sacred places weren't just external points on a map. They were actually internal places, places where I could find comfort uh, in my thinking and my way of being. Um, so that was another, I think, you know, at a very sort of uh, utilitarian level, what I love about walking is um, if we are able-bodied and I do not take my ability to walk with any grit with, I, I take it very seriously. I am very lucky to be able to go on these walks. Um, I think what I learned is that in its simplicity is its potential transformative, powerful capacity. Mm. I mean, one could say, I would say this in the first few years, it's only a walk, mm. but I think that is what's so powerful about it. Um, and, you know, there's no excuse. There's no gym membership needed. There's no time slot to show up for a teacher. There's no gear that's required. It is available to us, again, if we are able-bodied, to do it always. Mm. And so that makes it really, um, I think, really, really transformative. And I guess lastly, there's probably other lessons, but the one that's coming to mind right now is it's sort of based on something Thich Nhat Hanh said, which was um, really be conscious of the energy you're putting into each step because whatever you're holding, you put into the earth. So if I'm holding angst and anger and discontentment and as you step down, that energy is going into the earth. And that's not to say dismiss it. It's just be aware of it. Be aware mm -hmm. that what we're holding becomes part of where we are. Um, and so for me, walking is a way to soothe that a little bit um, and to be attentive at, to how my feet come to the ground. What am I holding? What am I bringing to um, a situation? I think that's probably relatable to your clients as well. How are you showing up in any situation? When you pick up the phone to, to call somebody, do you have the proper you know, mindset? Do you have the, and we can transform that. We have the yeah. ability to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I think the energy behind what we do is everything. And we focus so much in our world about what we're doing, really? you know, and yeah. and yeah. And this comes up a lot on the podcast and my work is like, you know, was this the wrong thing to do? And the question I always ask is about everything behind that. You know, how did you feel doing it? Why did you do it? How did it feel after you, you know, even with something like I watched five hours of Netflix, I'm like, okay, well, when you were done, did you feel refreshed and good and like excited and creative and all of those things? And I don't think we need to say that was like bad, but did you feel stressed and anxious and you couldn't sleep and all these things? Okay. Maybe there's something to look at there. And so I love that because I think we focus so much on the doing instead of like, what is behind inside the action like what's the energy around the action which is what I think about when you think of, when you were saying that about what you're putting into the earth like what's each energy you're sort of giving back to the earth um it's just a whole different yeah it's not just about like your step count on your watch <laughs> no it isn't and then when we think about how walking is so essential to culture in so many ways so my mm -hmm. practice is this sort of meditation practice, but think about how walking shows up in our world. So think about activism. Think about making mm -hmm. a statement culturally in the world. What do we do? We walk in the streets. It's walking, right? Mm -hmm. Think of the streets filled with people around whatever subject it is, walking together, walking. Think about, um, you know, the spiritual pursuits of pilgrims. What do they do? They walk from a place to a sacred spot, right? Mm. Walking. 
right? Think about creative people. Think about uh, Virginia Woolf, of course, Henry David Thoreau, part of their essential um, component for what they did. And I think it's about this energy, right? Mm -hmm. Was to walk to a place where they were able to express what they wanted to write. Virginia Woolf would talk about a walk was essential to her creative capacity. And I think that has to do with the energy. It's, you know, the energy of people walking in the streets together as we are side by side and passionate about this subject. This is collective energy walking forward, moving forward. So I think that energy, and then you, you know, sort of apply it to different arenas. It's certainly not just about the physical space. It's about how we show up in the world. How do we harness this energy? Yeah. So yeah. 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 And what you said a few minutes ago too, around, um, the quiet piece, Anna, the owner of Campo Vita yes. for everyone's listening again for your wine subscription, um, <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, well, said, said something beautiful to me recently. She said, um, I, I was sharing with her about a recent miscarriage and she was sort of talking me through it a little bit. And she said, um, she said, you know, I feel like something really needs to come through that. Like there's something that needs to like come through, um, or that's waiting to sort of come through yeah. you around this. And, and she basically said in so many words, the, the only way to, to have that happen is to create some space. Um, and I've been thinking about that so much recently, um, for so many things, you know, we talk on this podcast around a lot of different practices, even noticing your self critic or that inner dialogue we were talking about, or, you know, we, we talk about a lot of different ways to be more in touch with your thoughts, your beliefs, your body. And I think where folks sometimes then get frustrated, even in working one-on-one -on -one with me is when they don't have any space in their lives. And that's like where all the integration happens. You know, we're not just going to shift how we, what we believe, what we think, what, how, how we behave, our habits, because we learned how to, if we don't create any sort of space to do it. And I think even what I love about the way you talk about the walking practice is that I think sometimes we think of space as really big things like really we need to take need to go on a retreat or we need to you know go on this other thing and I think where I have found freedom for me really is in making my meetings from 60 minutes to 55 minutes and saying that space between those meetings that is sacred space and that's a little bit maybe to your point about the sacred is not just out there, the sacred is in me. And like, what happens when all of my meetings are 55 minutes instead of 60 or 25 instead of 30? I'm like honoring like the internal sacred space and saying, that's really what's necessary for me to then have the energy I want to have for the next call or show, transmit the right energy. You know, it's energy so contagious, whether it's to the earth or to each other. And so I love that reminder about um, quiet and space and, and not just being such a critical part of all this. Oh, I love that on our dearest, um, wisest. I know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's such a beautiful and uh, wise concept, right? How, how do we, how can we actually in, in some ways generate new or understand if there isn't the space to do it. Mm. So how in our day can we create those little pockets, those little moments where actually there is the space to either see clearly, to feel deeply, to hear the whispers. I mean, I, I've often said that for me, when I go out for a walk is when I can hear the little whispers of what my, what I instinctually maybe know, but haven't really um, allowed to be said out loud. Mm. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, even just talking about Henry David Thoreau or Virginia Woolf, they needed that space and that place to create. So I think it's it's an essential part of our day in order to live fully, wholly. I think I think that's right. I think her wisdom is always spot on, but that is a very clear, you know, articulation of potentially what a walk does is to frame out 
a time period in which you, it's a playground, right? It's a playground of what you're feeling, what you're prioritizing, how you're thinking about your day, problem solving. Um, it can host all those things, but unless we actually set aside time to do those things, they don't happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And listen to the birds. Like I just, I think about my husband wears a hearing aid um, because he has Meniere's disease. And he just heard a story from someone who was born without the ability to hear and just got hearing aids. And um, I think she had some hearing capacity before, but this has really transformed her, what her auditory ability and her reflection of the birds chirp all the time. And he was just like weeping, telling me this thing he read that she wrote. And I was just like, gosh, how many of us auditory challenges or not forget that the birds chirp all the time. Um, And I feel like walking is also getting outside is such a good reminder of like, especially when the world feels heavy and hard and like impossible um, that the birds are still chirping. Or as Emmy says, the the rainbow is hidden somewhere. Oh, I <laughs> love that. That's so true, right? Oh my gosh, yes. We That's saw a rainbow beautiful. one time and every day we passed that spot on the way to school. Mom, remember when we saw the rainbow? The rainbow's hidden somewhere back there. Yeah, I love that. You know, at the end of the day, to say it very, um, I'm not very good at this, but to say it very simply, it is that moment we say, holy smokes, I'm alive, right? Mm. <laughs> right, I, it, it just, um, you know, we just, all we have to do is spend five minutes looking at the statistical possibility of us being here and wow. Um, mm. But in terms of, um, you know, your clients and development, I think the thing about a walking practice or honestly any practice, quite honestly, where you, as you said, create space you allow some quiet to think through what it is that's important to you, how you want to approach the day. Um, it's all really valuable. And um, I think for me it has led to a much more um, fulfilled, in many ways, calm um, life. You know, and I have to say that this, this is sort of funny language. It's also something, I have a this splash of kind of control uh, you know, like to believe that I can control hmm. anything. Obviously, we can't. <laughs> but the thing that feels really nice about a walk often is I get to decide when I go, how I go. So it feels very, I get to decide. I have agency completely over that. Whereas in many other parts of life, we don't have total hmm. agency over it, whether we're responsible at, for, you know, to our clients or to, so it's a really, it's a pretty mm. profound time in that sort of having control over how you do it, what mm-hmm. you think about, how you host it. So, yeah. But you know what's so interesting about that that I've never thought about before is that you have control, but you like zoom it just to you because which is which is I feel like what that is such an incredible lesson it's like it could be raining the headwind could be really hard but you get to decide do you put on a raincoat what shoes do you wear and so you're not trying to like look up at the sky and try to change the clouds but you're like what is available to me to show up differently in this moment given all of the pieces of this that are out of my control where are the where which is the way in which I have control to show up in this. That's so beautifully said. Yes, you just said what I was trying to say. So thank you. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well, that's what you made. You said it, I guess, too, because that's what it made me think of. I was like, yeah, it's like, you know, and I think about some of your photos of you walking, which are so always so beautiful, but a huge variety of climates. You're on the East Coast, you're north of Boston. There are plenty of days that plenty of people would say it's not a walking day. And I think that is a lesson that really applies to everything is like there are plenty of moments in life where the external is uncomfortable and like what does it look like to to you know pick the pieces in that situation that we have control over and feel that sense of choice in how we interact with that environment that's exactly right how do we show up for ourselves in that moment yeah there are plenty of times even this winter where it's well below zero 
you know, the thermometer read minus six and the wind chill is minus 19 and it's snowing out. And again, the fidelity to the practice is what is nourishing to me. Hmm. Um, and to your point, what do I have control over? I have control over how long I go. Um, I have control over how I layer up, how I make myself feel safe, how I make myself comfortable when I come home. And to your point, yeah, I have, con I have control over each of those decisions. And um, that always feels really great. Um, so yes, right. I do. I have agency over the specifics of much of that. And it, that's an important component. Have there been any other habits that this daily walking practice has led to? Well, there's one. I'm now a very avid um, practitioner of uh, cold exposure. If any of your clients have heard of Wim Hof. And so because I live right on the, on the Atlantic Ocean for the last two and a half years, um, three or four times a week, um, a bunch of us get in the water. And again, this winter, there were times when it was the thermometer read seven and the wind chill was minus 18. Now, needless to say, we're all very careful. We're now very practiced. We have a system where we're all really safe, uh, but we get in the water. And the reason I started to do that practice was because again, I, I was sort of curious, quite honestly, I had this narrative that you're the one that's always cold. You're always wearing your puffy coat, no matter what. It's 80 degrees out, lives in our and I was actually that it was a it's kind of a subtle and kind of whimsical thing. I thought, I wonder if I can change that narrative. Mm. Can I change the narrative that I mean it's not unlike my walking practice? My narrative was you're an athlete. So how mm. do you how do you change that? How can it be more um, malleable, flexible? So you can mm. still be an athlete and be walking. So how do you change the narrative around your race cold? I hate the winter. Well, Lib, you live in Boston. So I thought, okay, well, what if I just regularly started to approach and get in the water? And to be perfectly honest, two and a half years later, I now crave it. We're going in the water this afternoon. Um, and it is so it was a little bit of an experiment around self-identification. I identified with that. I held on to that, that definition of who I was, you know, rigorously. And I think it was limiting. It was limiting to what, how I approached the world. It was limiting in terms of what I did. I'd say no to things because I'm the girl that's always cold. And so I, it really out of kind of experimentation because a number of thing, other things in my life changed that changed how I identified myself. I thought, well, here's a good practice arena. Can I take what the way I used to define myself and shift it and shift it with mm. approaching the thing um, you know, that I used to think was how I identified and, and get over it. And the answer is yes, you can, one can. Hmm. I love that story. And I um, also, why well, take cold showers or I for the same piece, but it's so interesting because I never thought about this. So I have Raynaud's disease. So um, I am also the person who's always cold. <laughs> And I have white fingers and white toes. And, um, but I was doing some reading, probably watching a lot of your cold plunges thinking she's totally crazy. And, but then I was like, but what is this? Like, what is this whole thing about? Did some research. And I was like, all right, I'm going to try it. And it's amazing. 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 It yeah. is better than any cup of coffee, good night's sleep, like massage. I don't even know how to describe it. It's like, it is the most amazing feeling in the entire world. It's like all your light switches turn on. Yeah. It's like, boom, yep. up, everything's like, yeah. So we, we have a group that dips on Friday afternoon plunges, whatever we want to call it. Um, and we call it happy hour. It's our Friday mm -hmm. afternoon, happy hour. There's no alcohol. We, none of it. That's not any, what really what it is. We're serving dopamine. Uh, cocktails yeah. right like we get in the water we have such fun we play we splash about mm -hmm. we get out everything's lit up lit up the dopamine is and it lasts for a very that dopamine lasts for a very long time <laughs> I highly recommend it um yeah it's um but again really the lesson is about what are those um things that you hold on to as um identifiers yeah and is is there any place in those those arenas where it limits what you're doing in life 
Um, you know, I, I, I was in the ad world, as I said, co-founded an agency, left that agency at the start of the pandemic. You know, for 30 years, I was the ad girl, right? Like I was a creative director in the ad business. Um, and then all of a sudden I wasn't, hmm. right? So how do you take those changing narratives about who you are and how can you um, shift them, love them into a new place? Mm -hmm. And so in a way, this cold practice was an experiment in how does one love that former definition of what you thought you were and begin to host a new definition. And I can imagine for your clients, I mean, I think sometimes we define ourselves as, I don't know, am I scared to make that call? Am I the, and how can we shift that so that the world is, you know, is spacious and we can step, we can take that next best step into a really spacious place. Um, so now I don't define myself as the cold girl. In fact, right now it's pretty warm. I mean, it's not super warm. I, like, I can't wait till the winter again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. And I think sometimes there are definitions of ourself that we are attached to, to consciously or attached to unconsciously. Like for me with fundraising, it was people pleasing. Like I wanted to make right. everybody comfortable. And right. from that part of my identity, fundraising was really hard because there is the risk that other people are going to be uncomfortable That's at right. certain points. And so for me, it was about identifying, okay, what does it look like for me to, you know, number one, mitigate discomfort for everyone by creating a conversation that feels actually really good. Like, and then also dealing with that people pleasing tendency that recognizes that change making is inherently going against the status quo. Going against the status quo is inherently not going to please certain people that like the status quo. And so I have to decide, do I want to be a change maker or do I want to be a people pleaser? Because I can't hold on to that identity if I want to do this work. And so it's so similar to that. And, and it didn't happen overnight. And it was about play and experimentation and seeing what worked for me and for me messing up and being like, oh, it wasn't that. <laughs> Not that one, um, but, and, and, but then really finding those practices that, that brought me into that alignment and, and, and this goes back to the cold plunge or my shower brought me online. That's how I feel after a shower, a cold shower, I walk out and I'm like, I am online. Right. And that is just such a meaningful way to live. Um, yeah. Yeah, it truly is. So to sort of weave some of this together. So think about uh, if you were to go for a walk and you were to really um, enjoy the quiet and one of the inquiries in that quiet might be, and I remember doing this, what are the things that I hold on to as um, the way I identify myself? And are they in fact limiting how I approach the world? And then is there a way to begin to shift that? So to your point, am I a people pleaser? Am I a caregiver to the at the expense of myself? Am I, um, you know, whatever the definition might be, you can begin to identify the identify those in the quiet with yourself, kindly, gently, no judgment. To me, that's what happens in the quiet of a walk. Then begin to look at each of those and ask yourself, okay. Um, you know, is this my best and highest self? Am I expressing what I have to offer at, at its fullest? Or are some of those definitions really holding me in a place that's too small, that's, um, mm. to your point, not allowing me to fully show up? Um, so then you, I can say, okay, well, that definition that I'm holding on to maybe is limiting me. Okay, mm. so now how can I gently hold and love that definition and inv invite shifting in that so that it's more expansive, so that it's no longer limiting, so that I, I can take that next best step and not say, well, that doesn't align with my definition of myself. I can't mm -hmm. do that. But in fact, I can do that. And so that that's sort of how that all went. On walks, I identified, you're always cold. Okay, well, mm -hmm. let's experiment with that. And so, I yeah. love that.
I love that. Let's leave folks with that, with that practice and tell everyone where they can find you about the new podcast, um, how they can connect with you. And if you'd like to highlight a nonprofit as well, we invite everyone to do so at the end. Thismorningwalk.com is sort of a hub for a lot of this information and in my practice. Um, also, I'm in wonderful partnership with a woman named Alex L um, around a podcast where she and I are in conversation about some of these lessons that we've learned um, on our walk. She has started her practice. She's almost a year in. I'm 10 years in. I have a lot to learn from remembering those early days of walking. So the um, podcast is also called This Morning Walk. It's on Apple and Spotify. I, there's also an Instagram handle, This Morning Walk, where we host community. Alex and I um, share what we're up to. We share this community, which is ever growing and beautiful. And then my personal Instagram is park, P-A-R-K here. Park's my middle name. And actually, the reason I, what I did when I started my practice 10 years ago is I just said to myself as an act of accountability, I was going to take one picture of my walk every single day. They were terrible. I mean, don't scroll back 10 years. I mean, I, they're, just, they're not valuable other than to say it was a tool that for me as a visual person was really helpful. I didn't want to, I wanted to go out and sort of, it was my visual journal. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, thismorningwalk.com, podcast, This Morning Walk, Instagram handle. And of course, the nonprofit that I would love to highlight is Blink Now and um, our dear friend Maggie Doyne and her co-founder Tote Mob, who um, are really um, changing and supporting the lives of so many in rural Nepal. And I adore them and I adore that whole crew. I mean, they're doing incredible work. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll put links to everything below and in the show notes as well. So folks have an easy time finding you. Thank you so much um, for this conversation today. I love it. And I will say your questions are so thoughtful and I hope the answers are helpful to your listeners. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you.